Good afternoon, all. Sorry, I wasn't planning on using a podium, but I guess in order to do so, I have to be in order to be on the Zoom. So um, my name is Rebecca DeVoe. I'm the Director of State Relations uh, for the University of Michigan. Uh, State Relations uh, is within the Office of the Vice President for Government Relations. We report directly to President Ono. Um, a big part of what we do is uh, the university's engagement here in Lansing from for all three uh, branches of government. And then also we work uh, significantly with nonprofits, other advocacy agencies, state on a variety of different things. And one of those is specifically um, water affordability and other types of massive infrastructure issues that you uh, tend to hear about um, regarding our in-depth uh, research, academic research at the university um, issues. Today, um, I apologize, Sean Hammond from our office uh, had to not be here. So I am going to kind of work my way through this. So I apologize uh, that it's not as smooth as he would have it. Um, the Wolverine Caucus, for everyone's awareness, is a joint effort between um, the University of Michigan's uh, Vice President, Chris Kolb, and the Alumni Association. Uh, we always have our uh, strong alumni here on a regular basis. We also have a few of them uh, logging in here because it's excellent that MML allows us to do a live streaming. Um, so we're very thankful for that. So with that, uh, as all of you know, for those of you uh, thank you to Representative Jen Hill and Senator Stephanie Chang for attending. My understanding is, is that they have local government right now, and then they will possibly be back in. Senator Chang has already worked with our esteemed uh, presenters today on a regular basis, as you can imagine, with her district, uh, water affordability and access are a significant issue that they are trying to address. So without further ado, uh, today, uh, you all got the invite, so I won't repeat exactly what we're talking about, and I won't uh, upstage our guests, uh, but I would like to um, welcome Aline, Aline, Aline Bentanzo, uh, from um, who, as you all know, you should have received um, the most recent water affordability, a statewide assessment, and she is going to walk us through that, the policy implications, and um, the efforts that they are making ongoing. Um, also with us is, um, you know, I told Noah I was going to, I thought his last name six times in my head and then I, I screwed it up, Noah Atal. Um, Noah is a dual master's candidate in public policy and also with our School of Information um, and is here and a part of that research study. So I will turn it over to you all and I hope this works. Thank you. Thank you guys. Um, and the, the trick and the mystery is presenting, getting, getting started in the game on the Zoom. Hold on. You got it. You're good. Hey, but is it on the Zoom? Yes. Yeah. While they're getting started here, um, one item that I didn't mention is, is that after um, Aline and Noah's presentation will also allow for questions uh, from uh, possibly the Zoom as well. And so it is being shared. Yep. And we've got the title slide up here. Oh, great. It looks like everything is working. Thank you so much for being here today. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity to share our work with you. My name is Elin Betanzo, and I'm the founder and president of Safe Water Engineering, and I'm here with my co-author, Noah Atal, for this project. We did, uh, with the University of Michigan Water Center, Water Affordability in Michigan, a statewide assessment. There we go. I want to acknowledge our team members uh, for this project, Jennifer Reed, uh, Richie Harrison, and Ashley Stoltenberg from the University of Michigan Water Center and Michigan State Extension. 
were all parts of this co-authors in this project and it was supported by the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. Before I get started going into the details of our report, I want to acknowledge that our work builds on the foundational efforts by numerous community-based organizations around the state that have worked to make water affordability a uh, major uh, issue, working to stop water shutoffs, improving access to safe water in general. We are grateful for the work these organizations have done to raise awareness and bring attention to the challenge of water affordability. And they have been busy bringing solutions at the local, state, and federal levels and have really made Michigan a leader when it comes to addressing water affordability nationwide. We published this report in 2022, and we want to share this report with you today because it provides a statewide quantification of the challenge of water unaffordability. This assessment provides the data foundation necessary to build solutions to our water affordability challenges across the state of Michigan. When we started this project, we set out to identify and understand the challenges faced by households, communities, and water utilities, and the state government in addressing water affordability and access to water services across the state. We included all water costs in our water affordability analysis. So that means water for domestic use, sanitary sewer, and where stormwater is included in water bills that was also included in our analysis. As we completed our analysis, we found that affordability issues exist statewide in every community. There are individual households in every type of community in the lower and upper peninsula that all have challenges paying their water bills. So this is in urban, suburban, and rural communities. And then we also have challenges at the community level when we have many households within the community that struggle to pay their water bills, there ends up being substantial unmet investment needs at the community level. That all comes together to create community level challenges. As we compiled data for this report, it became clear that there is a lack of comparable utility level financial infrastructure and maintenance data across the state of Michigan. So to adequately interpret the information that we were able to collect, we knew that the experiences of key stakeholders would be fundamental to identifying, characterizing, and expanding important household and utility level issues. So we interviewed 32 stakeholders that represent community groups, water utilities, and municipal and state governments. They provided many different perspectives on affordability and provided nuance to our report. So some of the things we heard from these 32 interviewees are that the cultural, socioeconomic, and technical legacy of historic disinvestment in our urban centers perpetuates differences among communities. History matters and needs to be taken into account when plans are being made to move forward. There are many often competing perspectives on the causes of unaffordable water, and a narrative has developed about perceived choice and ability to pay, and this undermines the opportunity to find solutions. In reality, when households struggle to afford their water bills, they are struggling to afford all of their essential services. They are not simply choosing to not pay their water bill. These experiences mean that solutions need to account for context, history, and politics and be built upon equity. We learned that the lack of utility level data along with minimal opportunity for true public engagement has eroded trust between utilities and the communities they serve. This lack of data also means that rate setting is often driven by electoral politics and can end up undermining the integrity of a local water system. Finally, there are both real and perceived constraints on utility level financing and there's room for creativity and improvement. As we talk about water affordability, it is important to consider why water infrastructure, water affordability and maintaining water service in every home is so important. Water infrastructure is essential for meeting and managing basic human needs. Public health begins and ends with clean and available water. People must have access to safe drinking water to survive and access to sanitation to prevent disease. When households can't afford their water bill and are threatened with water shutoffs, it threatens the health of those individuals and the members of their community. The stakeholders we interviewed all agreed that all Michiganders need available and affordable, safe and sustainable drinking water and sanitation services. It's a matter of figuring out the policy solutions to make this happen. To accomplish this, Michigan must find a way to ensure economic stability at the household level and at the community or water utility level. 
To get there, we need to work our way through the multiple competing and divisive narratives that have developed over the years. The policy legacy and lived experiences of communities and community members are important to consider and incorporate into policy solutions moving forward. A sustainable solution to our water affordability challenges would require addressing needs and capacity gaps at the three levels that we explored in our study. The household level, this would be support for households facing unique economic situ situations. The community or water utility level, which would be eliminating the infrastructure investment gap and ensuring communities with the least financial stability and capacities are prioritized for support. And then at the state level, including capacity to secure statewide utility level data and ensure appropriate local water rates. So I'll start our data analysis portion by sharing average Michigan water bills over time. So water infrastructure was funded primarily by grants through the 1980s and water rates covered operation and maintenance. The average inflation adjusted water costs roughly doubled since 1980 to 2018. So this is about 188% increase uh, for Michigan as a whole. <clears throat> Small cities and suburbs and rural communities follow that trend. You can see that on the far right. But then we have larger urban areas that have seen a sharper rise in costs, some up to 320%. After 1980, we switched to a system where water utilities rely primarily on ratepayers to cover the costs. And now those costs include rehabilitation, replacement, planning for the future, addressing new requirements and new public health threats. The fact that these are now paid for with loans and interest just compounds the water rate increases and continues to make water unaffordable. Water infrastructure has a high fixed cost. It costs the most to get the first gallon of water delivered to your home and to ensure the infrastructure is always functioning so the water will come on when you turn on your tap and the water will go away every time you flush your toilet. <clears throat> As cities lose population or water conserving devices improve, water utilities still must distribute the same increasing fixed costs across their population. The more the water utilities can rely on consistent revenue, the better planning and efficient resources they can use to manage their water rate increases. And so you can see these issues compounding each other in the water cost increases in this graph, especially in the communities like Detroit and Flint. When we look at all essential services, uh, water services we found to be the smallest in magnitude. And although water bills are the smallest of all of our essential services, it has had the greatest percent increase from 1986 to 2018. Water bills have increased 443%. And compared to the other essential services listed here on this slide, there are no comprehensive federal or state long-term programs to support residents in paying their water bills. The challenges individual households have in paying for their water service contributes to a revenue gap at the community and utility level. Some communities have a large population that struggles to afford their water bills. In this situation, some water utilities want to make sustainable infrastructure improvements, but they're concerned that raising their water rates to meet the infrastructure investment needs will mean that residents will stop paying for water. So they allow the infrastructure investment gap to persist. The other significant contributor to this gap is the longstanding reluctance of elected officials to raise water rates. This lack of revenue means reduced capacity to reinvest in infrastructure. This chart shows the 20 year estimates of water infrastructure needs compared to reported spending and the resulting shortfall. We calculated, this was our 2022 calculation, we calculated $20 billion over 20 years or 1 billion per year. Every time these investments are delayed, it just drives up the overall costs and will eventually fall even harder on residents struggling to afford their water bills. So this is our calculation from two years ago. There's been a lot of infrastructure funding. Uh, we haven't had an opportunity to update this, but I am hopeful that it has not increased because of other infrastructure funding that has become available in that time period. As we heard repeatedly across our stakeholder inter interviews, Deferring investment can lead to more expensive maintenance and costly emergency repairs. This leads to system inefficiency that hits residents in the forms of increased water and sewer rates. Delaying adequate funding continues to drive up the overall cost of water infrastructure, and the sooner we get this problem under control, the less it costs. 
So now I'm going to turn this over to Noah Atal, who's our lead data analyst for the project to present the numbers from our report. Wait, Noah. Before you could dive into that, if you could explain that last chart just to help us understand what's in each one of those categories, I think I presume to know, but um, in particular, the drinking water treatment versus the clean water treatment, the EPA portion. Uh -huh. So the drinking water treatment is uh, for drinking water, clean water, we often call it sewer, the, you know, under funding under the clean water, uh, say revolving fund, those clean water, um, sewer, uh, wastewater treatment plant funding. And the distribution would include mains all the way up to maybe the, the shoulder and the service lines? Yes, yeah. So um, a lot of times our infrastructure estimates have separated the water treatment infrastructure costs from the buried infrastructure costs. So that's a water distribution. So water mains, pumps, um, tanks, all the, all the infrastructure that gets water to a house. And uh, since up until last year, we hadn't include lead service line replacement costs in that. That's why there's a separate line item for that in this chart. Gotcha. And the COG data is what's anticipated moving through the system that we have available to spend right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. So this is a, this looks like a ten billion dollar shortfall over the next twenty years. Um, if I'm interpreting that correctly, well, the is it a twenty billion dollars on top of the ten. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so this thirty is billion a, costs. Yeah. Then the twenty billion. Okay. Yeah. This is a really helpful chart um, for a lot of discussions right now. And this, you said the data is two years old for this. Yeah, we this is published in our 2022 report. Thank you. Yeah. But I'll note that a lot of the numbers came from studies that were done previous to that. So okay. they weren't studies done in 2022. They were studies done in the five years previous to that, that we compiled. Perfect. Thank you. And just acknowledging new infrastructure funding. I know I got a ton of alerts yesterday about um, funding being distributed across the country. <laughs> I'm like taking yes. pictures of these charts and sending them to numbers. So I want to make sure I have the interpretation right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Elon, and thank you for the questions. Feel free to ask as we continue here, because we have a smaller group. It can be a little bit more discussion-based. So as Elon previous outlined, uh, water affordability in Michigan is a multifaceted issue, and therefore we drew from a range of data sources at the household, community, and utility level to help answer some of these questions. To understand affordability at the household level, we primarily use the IPUMS, which is the integrated public use data from the census. This allowed us to understand at the household level what water costs were and what household income are, as well as other demographic um, factors in order to calculate how much people are paying in their water services across Michigan. This was paired with the customer expenditure survey to understand some other expenses that weren't present in the, in the IPUMS data. At the community level, we used uh, the Mich uh, a rates survey. We surveyed over 300 different municipalities across Michigan to understand what their rates were. And this kind of helped us fill one of the gaps in the IPUMS data, which is the IPUMS doesn't do a great job of understanding what affordability looks like in small communities. This is because small communities are hard to sample from. It's hard to get a, rep a representative sample of households from a community that's only 500 people. So we combined these two methods in order to get a holistic picture of affordability across the state. At the utility level, as we just presented, we use the a EPA, the AWWA needs surveys, as well as the census of governments to do calculations on what infrastructure needs were. And I'll note, as Elon mentioned before, uh, one of the greatest challenges in collecting data for this project was the lack of comparable financial data at the utility level. Uh, you'd have to go individually utility to utility in order to collect that information. So it made it very difficult to compare how utilities are doing outside of these standardized um, surveys that are already happening at the federal level. <clears throat> so the question is, how do we characterize water affordability? Uh, this graph or these pie charts will show you that there are a couple of different ways of doing it. And one of the major ways is looking at water costs as a function of household income. So you look at how much someone is spending on water and what their household income is, and you can understand what percentage of their household income they're spending towards water and sewer services. And what we see is in 1980, about 1.6% of households had really high water bills. They were spending more than 5% of their income towards water and sewer services. That increased in 2018 to 6.7% of Michigan homes. It's a very big increase. And the percent of homes with 
really high burdens, water burdens. And you'll see across the distribution here, it's not just that darkest wedge that's increasing. We have people spending a lot more people spending three, four to five percent, three to four, and two to three percent of their income towards water services than we have in the past. And this is partly because of a little bit of stagnation in incomes, but again, as Elon mentioned before, a really increased uh, prices of water in this time frame. We can also look at the data geographically. And when we look at the data geographically, uh, we do it through these public use micro areas, which are roughly 100,000 people geographies. In these geographies, we ask the question for the 10 most 10 percent most vulnerable households, so the poorest 10 percent of households, how much of their disposable income are they spending on water and sewer services? And that question we answer here with, you know, there's large sections of the state that are spending 15, 20, 25 percent of their disposable income on water and sewer services. And this is for that, those vulnerable households in the bottom 10th of the income distribution. Uh, it's not just confined to urban areas. We see areas in the Thumb and across in Michigan that also people are really struggling to afford bills. This also asks then how, what percentage of households statewide are struggling to afford their water services. There's a couple different ways that you can measure this. And there's a lot of different research that's been done. One of the chief ways is the UN 5% benchmark. This asks uh, what percent of households have are spending more than 5% of their income towards water and sewer services. With that calculation, about 6.59% of US households are above that threshold. You can also look at an income-based program that was designed by Roger Colton for Detroit and implemented in Philadelphia. A program like that, 10.26% of households would apply um, and have unaffordable bills. You could also look at something like affordability ratio 10 which I just described that disposable income, how much of your disposable income are you paying? And if you're, are you above a 10%, are you spending more than 10% of your disposable income towards water services? If that's the case, around 10.75% of households have unaffordable bills. Granted, these are all just thresholds and metrics. None of them really define what unaffordability is, but we start to get a sense of the number of households that are struggling in Michigan holistically. Another question you can ask is, how much money would it cost to bring those bills down? And we see with these different thresholds, we're looking somewhere between 80 million and $145 million annually to put people or put to have households not be above these thresholds. What I've talked about so far has all been at the household level. We also have communities and utilities. So what, with the rate survey, what we were able to ask is, we were able to define a, um, a variable called AR20, which is affordability ratio 20, developed by Emmanuel Teodoro at Wisconsin. And this variable, it asks um, for a household at a 20th percentile income, so the poorest one-fifth of a community, how much are they paying in their disposable income towards water and sewer services? What we see here is, there's around 450 water systems in which a household in that poorest one-fifth of the community is paying between 5 and 10% of their disposable income towards water. Uh, the unaffordability threshold for this ratio is around 10%. So we see that there's over 200 systems that are above that. This is an important ratio because it allows us to look not just at individual systems, but systems by size. And that's what we've done in this graph. We've shaded um, different blocks of each one of these columns with different system sizes. So the lightest colors are systems that are under 500 people. The darkest colors are 10K or more. And what you see is in that 10 to 15 range and above, we have systems that are under 500. We have systems between 500 and 3,000 people served. And we have systems all the way up between 10 and 100,000 people. So this metric is great because it kind of fills the gap that we can't understand at the household level, which is how are these small systems doing? And we see that they're struggling just as much as other systems are. This isn't a uniform. We're not just seeing large systems struggling with affordability or just small systems. It's across the spectrum. Lastly, before this presentation, I was up to, able to update a couple of our numbers. The numbers I was showing you before were all um, 2018 data or, or previous. And what I can look at is I can look at the proposed uh, low income water residential assistance program um, proposed in bills uh, five, 549 and 550 is also house bills uh, 5088 and 5089. That program uh, defines eligibility by anyone who is underneath 200% of the uh, federal poverty level 
and it says it decreases or it caps bills at 3% if you're under 200% of the poverty level and 135 if you're under or and 2% of income if you're under 135 of the poverty level. A program like that would have, uh, there'd be around 12% of Michiganders applicable or eligible to be a part of. And that represents around 291,000 households statewide. With a 40% enrollment rate, you'd look at a gap payment of around uh, $74 million annually. And that 40% uh, comes from Roger Fulton's original research in Detroit. Uh, but you could also use another benchmark like LIHEAP, which is the Low Income Heating and Energy Assistance Program that's done nationwide. They have around a 20% participation rate. So that uh, gap payment can vary a little bit. And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about RAP and Detroit Lifeline rights. These are two affordability programs that have been updated significantly since we produced this uh, report. Um, RAP changed from just giving $25 a month to households as um, assistance to being an income-based program. And the Detroit Lifeline right came out to help Detroiters uh, similarly. Both programs bring people's bills to affordable levels. However, the RAP, program, the RAP program has a two-year maximum enrollment. So what we see here is Macomb County RAP enrollments over the last five years. And everyone who enrolled in 2019, 20, and 21 would no longer be eligible for the program anymore. And the people who enrolled after they changed to an income-based program in 2022, you'll see there's a significant jump. People really appreciated that program. They'll no longer be eligible for the program next year. For the lifeline rate, there's no maximum amount of time someone can be on that in Detroit. However, that program was half funded by GLIWA and half funded by Detroit, and they got a lot of money from the infrastructure bills passed federally. Um, and that was a lot of the funds they were using to fund that program. I know they're still looking for other funds to um, help with that. And I'm excited when more data comes out to understand the impacts of that in Detroit and in GLIWA holistically. Yes. Just a quick clarification question. With the RAP program, it says maximum enrollment is two years. Is that just, you know, once somebody's on it for two years, that's it. You know, 10 years down the road, they can't go back to it. It's, you can only be on it for two years. And once you've been on it for two years, that, you know, you're no longer eligible for it any longer. And to. My understanding is for the same thing. there's uh, extended eligibility for the RAP program, for, but people who aren't seniors. Um, they have a two-year, they get enrolled for one year and the next, and I don't think they're eligible afterwards. Okay. But I can get back to you uh, uh, just, on that. I just curious if, you know, the yeah, idea you know, enroll for two years, wait for five years, and be able to roll over. I don't, uh, to the best of my recollection, I don't remember there being any, like, waiting period in between. It was just a two-year enrollment. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back to Elin for, to go over our recommendations uh, for this, and thank you all. So when we publish this report, we encourage policymakers, state legislators, water utilities, and community members to work together to develop a solution package to address each of the six points that we covered in our recommendations. And so we have been seeing a lot of these conversations happening over the past two years, which has been really great to see the progress that has been made. So our recommendations in the report, it's a six point package. They all come together. It's not a menu of options. All of these are necessary to achieve a sustainable solution for our water affordability challenges. And if we don't address each of these points, we're gonna keep coming back and having to keep uh, addressing this program again and again. So the number one a recommendation here is to address the household capacity to pay. And so this needs um, recognition that the challenges that facing households are not uniform. Uh, for example, we have households with arrearages where they have a long, you know, standing bill that they have not been able to pay down. There are households with long-term poverty that need a long-term solution. There are households with short-term economic challenges where a short-term program like that RAP program would be appropriate. And then there's also uh, households with private wells and septic systems that have water affordability challenges as well. So the sources of the challenges in each of these scenarios are different and they each require a targeted solution. Economically vulnerable communities need additional focused support. So this is a reference to communities that don't necessarily have other support options like private philanthropy that step in to cover water bills 
or a capacity to run their own independent affordability program. There is typically a greater concentration of need in these communities, and they need focused support to ensure that those who struggle to afford their water bills are able to maintain their water and sewer services. The next major recommendation is to ensure that there are no water shutoffs for economically vulnerable households. If there is a solution to address household capacity to pay as laid out in item one here, this should be a non-issue. Households would be able to afford their water bills on an ongoing basis under that affordability program. When they are paying an affordable water bill, the threat of shutoffs would become a thing of the past. Then there's the need to address the gaps in utility capacity. Where utilities are undercharging, they may be struggling to maintain their staff and infrastructure, and they're concerned that transferring that gap to rate payers will make their water unaffordable. So there's an opportunity to bridge that infrastructure gap by filling the gap at the community level rather than raising the burden on individual households. And again, similar to the household observation in recommendation one, we know that economically vulnerable communities with the least financial resources are those that require the most investment. Now, getting back to our struggle with our project, the lack of comparable utility level financial and affordability data, like rate structures, arrearages, budgets, where are we at every water utility as a whole statewide, that data was not available. Infrastructure and maintenance data, like renewal needs, what are the capital improvement plans of Michigan water utilities? That made this project challenging. So moving forward, it will be important to collect consistent data across the state to both evaluate the need and the effectiveness of water infrastructure funding and water affordability programs. Our stakeholder interviews identified the need for true public engagement to build trust with the impacted community and ensure that infrastructure decisions are being made that meet community needs and goals. Public engagement is not just, commuting, just, it's not just communicating clearly to the public about decisions that a water utility has already made, but it's also taking into account what the public wants and needs and incorporating that feedback into community plans. Finally, there is an important role for the state to oversee these programs and ensure that they are functioning. There needs to be adequate authority and resources to ensure that regulations are sufficient for protecting public health and ensuring adequate enforcement to ensure those requirements are met consistently. There is no oversight or third party review of water rates in the state of Michigan. So there is an important role that the state could play here to review water rates to make sure whether they're sufficient to fund public health protection, to make sure they're not too low, they need to be able to sustain the water infrastructure. And they could play a more active role in finding creative solutions to addressing affordability challenges in specific communities. So these six recommendations, these are the six pieces of the comprehensive solution package that's needed to make a sustainable uh, change and address water affordability uh, going forward. So just kind of to wrap up our presentation today, a little summary of where I see us standing today in Michigan on water affordability. When families cannot afford to pay their water bills, public health protection is weakened for the entire community and water utilities lack consistent funding to ensure consistent service. The water affordability challenge is a public health challenge. Updates and increases in the Great Lakes Water Authority RAP program enrollment begin to demonstrate the need for a water affordability program. And so we have specific data for Southeast Michigan in that program, but it's a two-year solution and many of the residents need a long-term solution. Households in every community across the state struggle with water affordability. Most communities, especially small communities, do not have access to sustainable affordability resources. And finally, Ensuring that residents can afford to continue paying their water bills means that water utilities can better plan for their infrastructure needs. And with that planned income, that allows them better control over water rates for everybody. So that is my conclusion here for our report. Here is a tiny table of the list of all the people we interviewed for the report. And you can find that online in the handout that you have The um, that's in the abbreviated uh, and a briefing sheet for our report. There is a full report that is linked to that you should be able to access that from your handout um, and you will be able to read this list um, better. 
and you get there. So thank you, Elon and Noah. Um, just want to open it up for questions if anyone has any questions. And if I, you could say your name, oh, when you have where you're Maxwell, Senate Fiscal Agency. I was wondering if you could go to the slide that showed the inflation adjusted um, water bills and talk about what would be the driver of the differential because it, it says the bills is that actually the utility cost differential too no, this so one that, yeah so what we're seeing here is we're seeing this is the reported um water rates at a, at a household level for these different communities so the average average water the average reported so a household will report what their water costs are annually and they've been reporting that in uh, I've been stayed out since 1980. So you can look at what the inflation rate adjusted is. Why would why would there be a differential in terms of the rate changes? So, for example, um, where we have cities with population loss, the infrastructure cost is fixed, and so they need to get that money to keep it up. So when people are leaving, that means they're distributing that fixed cost on, across a smaller population. So each end, household's bill becomes larger. And so um, that's one of multiple factors that would be driving up that cost in Flint and Detroit. Do you have any other there? I'm going to say there's been a lot of water efficiency usage, which decreases the amount of um, volume that's going through the system, which exacerbates that problem. High fixed costs, but then you're distributing less and less water as appliances and households get more efficient. So rates go up. Elon and uh, Noah, for your context, uh, the Senate Fiscal Agency does, uh, they're a nonpartisan agency that report to the Senate and they do evaluation for fiscal impact, as it as the name states. So it's, um, but it's very complicated. So if, if you need to connect later, I like your reports. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Lots of reports. Any additional questions? And then I have one. Oh, yeah, please go. Um, on your number four recommendation, mm -hmm. what does that look like? Is there other states that have a centralized repository or do they have some type of rate making um, aid that they have to uh, provide, you know, data and support that perhaps like the AG or someone, you know, argues on the consumer's behalf. How does that, what does that look like? Yeah, so I think the best we've seen on this is um, the Environmental Finance Center in North Carolina. They've, they've been collecting their data dashboard where they're doing some of this, right? Yeah, at the state level, there's some, a lot of water utilities would be governed by a um, public utilities commission which will collect all financial reporting, rate structures, and and then- So Wisconsin would be yeah, an Wisconsin example of that. Example of that. Uh, but a lot of, a decent amount of states have them. I think Pennsylvania has one, California has one. Uh, we don't have one for water here. We have, um, which, which means that none of it's collected centrally. And then there's a lot of agencies or a lot of uh, different universities will collect all the information from those different, um, uh, public utility commissions and compile them and that's what they're so doing. So in those states, do the municipalities or the owner of the water system have to make a rate case to the commission and get it approved? I am unaware. In some states but, that happens, not all states, sometimes, and sometimes it's just privately owned water utilities that have to do that. But there's a whole smorgasbord <laughs> of options. Kind of riffing off the gentleman's inflationary questions, if we had data pushing towards the contemporary moment, um, would we expect to see differential pressures from workforce and labor shortage issues by by region, by even by a city? Like would lack of a bit, you know, I know for example, some communities are moving very quickly on lead service lines and it's putting stress on the available labor force. Would that cause local inflationary pressures possibly? Or it's something we're not going to really know, and it won't flesh out in the data for several years. We have like a two-year gap Two in terms of when we get good data versus, you know, so that's at least at the household level. And those pressures wouldn't really, I mean, like water costs are continuing to rise. I mean, we see Glee on all systems just continually yeah. do their maximum amount of rate hikes they can do. Uh, the question then is how, how is household income affected? And that would 
is that balancing out those how much people what percentage of their income they're paying towards bills because the bills just keep on going up so is is household income keeping track or not right. is kind of the question i have a quick question for you guys i, I think what from my perspective of with all of these recommendations what do you feel as if from a priority standpoint and then also what are next steps for the two of you as far as engagement level and I know that you're working with Senator Chang and some others but um, what would be your ideal next steps and then um, uh, or actual next step yeah. well so you know our recommendations we have as a package but you know, as a public health issue keeping the water on for everybody is a public health priority and I in my work, I always like to be you know, guided by the public health protection um, that has to come first before everything else. Um, so, so that I guess that's that part. Um, we continue to share the results of the study and we have been doing a few updates. Um, we've also done some work through the project, um, providing recommendations for the, um, the LIWAP program, the federal program that we have had that as I'm pretty sure has expired, right? The federal program. Um, but we had a set of recommendations that we had put towards that program if we should be lucky enough to get that renewed and made a uh, long-term program. So we continue to be active in this space and trying to uh, provide data to the conversation. Okay. Well, thank you both for um, coming and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, this will be up on our website, I think is a live uh, or live a recording uh, for if you need to view anything. And then we will get all of the materials if you need them and the PowerPoints as well. And I'll just put a plug in for those of you working on policy or legislation. One issue uh, when it comes to data that we're always at, at a university from a public policy standpoint, it is trying to push is um, empower the legislature to say that you can in bills uh, say where where data goes and that data is collected and it would um, we think that we want to elevate the individuals uh, within the university specifically at the water center places like the water center where we know that they have a public mission. They have a, a direct external facing kind of organization. So they understand um, the benefits of not just having the data for their research needs, but for the public good needs. So um, if you want to know more about that, feel free to ask Sean and I, uh, we have some draft language for anyone uh, that would like to ever get into that um, part of the work. So with that, thank you all for coming. Take some food, there's plenty. Thank you.